early in my career, I had a board member ask me for a cup of coffee. And I was like, the coffee's on the table behind you. But I was thinking, one, I am not the secretary. And two, this is the most expensive cup of coffee you are ever going to have because I have single-handedly made and saved this company over a million dollars. So let's talk about it. How do black women have to face discrimination, sexism, racism, all the other isms at work and how you can deal with them. So let's get into it. Mercedes, I'm the career love coach, and it is in my entire dream, goal, passion, whatever you want to call it, to coach black women. I help black women make better decisions for their career so that they can feel fulfilled, valued, like their work matters, and most importantly, so that they feel safe at work. And wherever you are in America and beyond, it's likely that you have faced discrimination, sexism, racism, colorism, whatever it is, I'm sure that you have faced that in your career. So I wanted to create a video that's really tackling these things, telling some of my stories, what I've done, how I think you should handle it, and especially how I coach black women to handle these when they face them in their careers. It is so critical that we know how to handle these things well, because when we face a career setback like layoffs or being fired or even having performance issues or not getting the promotions that we're really sh we should be at where we are in our careers, we face worse outcomes when trying to correct those, being re-entering the workforce and otherwise. So let's talk about them. Let's get into it. <laughs> Um, I also want to say that I think I'm going to provide a lot of details, but I'm also going to provide a lot of stories as we go through. And definitely at the end, I'm going to help you make a decision about whether or not you, yeah, how you need to handle this, what you need to do next. So make sure you stay until the end so you can get that information so that you can make the best decisions for your career. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into number one. So y'all know I like a list and we are starting off with the application and interview process. Yes, black women are systemically screened out of opportunities that we are really deserving of. Um, and some of that, you know, comes from us having dealt with that is those issues, but a lot of it just comes from the stereotypes that are out there about black women. So I will tell you this story. And I think the interesting thing about this is often we think those stereotypes are only one way when actually when we don't even line up to the stereotypes we're still negatively impacted so one of my stories was is what I call the reverse angry black woman in an interview right so I went to an interview I was super excited I showed up like I was really really super excited for this position um and so I got into the position excuse me got into the interview and I thought I did really well I got to the interview, uh, the end of the interview, I got to some opportunities to ask my own questions of that interview panel. And when I, I think I asked a question that was like, hey, you know, when have you, or what, you know, what is, is there anything else about my background or experience that, you know, would be a concern for you, you know, moving forward or something like that? Or, oh, actually, you know what? I asked, what would be the biggest challenge for me coming into this role, right? Because I don't like to ask interview questions that, at the end of an interview as a job applicant, that kind of puts them on the spot about like negative things about me. And so the interviewer did not say anything negative, but they were like, I don't know, Mercedes, we just have a really tough crowd here. And I'm thinking, what does a tough crowd mean? And so the interviewer proceeds to talk about, you know, how, you know, their audience is difficult and, you know, this person really has to be do well with tough conversations. And in the back of my head, I'm like, you, like, tough conversations, talking to your audience, have you seen my audience? Like, I've been dealing with people that, you know, are upset, I got flicked off at work one day, okay, stuff happens when you're in human resources, okay, this is actually outside of HR. Um, but all of that being said, they judged me based on my demeanor, and what I would consider being the opposite of that uh, angry black woman trope of being aggressive and overly assertive and bossy, right? 
Um, and so when I didn't really fit into that niche, they're like, oh, well, she doesn't have what it takes to deal with our audience. And so when you're faced like something like that, whether they are stereotyping you in any kind of way, <laughs> the angry black woman or otherwise, um, you have an opportunity to take an action. So the action that I always want you to take is to set the record straight, especially when you're in an interview or you're in a place where somebody has made an assumption for you. And the best way to set the record straight is to tell a story. Um, and so one of the stories that I told was how I was dealing with a very difficult benefits and compensation problem. Nobody gets more angry than when their compensation or their benefits are messed up, okay? It's just, there's there's nothing else that you can do to fix that other than get them their money or fix their benefits, okay? So I told that story about how that was a huge challenge for me, how I overcame that. And at the end of the day, I was not selected for that position, which leads me to my last point. My advice here is let it go where it may. I am never going to convince somebody that I am valuable and worthy of what I do. I am amazing at what I do. And so I'm not going to sit here and try and overcome stereotypes because at the end of the day, if I enter that organization where I've already been stereotyped, where assumptions have already been made about me, there is no way I want to work there, okay? And that's what I want you to take from this, right? We do not have to be a martyr. We do not have to make a point. We are going to do at the end of the day what is best for us. And if that is standing your ground, saying your piece and moving on to another job and you didn't get that one, I think that's a blessing, period. Okay, number two is about workplace culture. And for black women, that often uh, leads to being mistreated or um, not really receiving the same resources as our counterparts. Um, and for me... I'm very driven and I feel that a lot of the times I don't notice when this comes up for me. Um, and I've even had my workplace allies come up to me and say, hey, uh, what, what's going on there? And I'm like, I don't know, that person's just crazy. <laughs> so I feel like sometimes I do really miss when things really may be racially motivated or, yeah, um, or sexist motivated. That's not really what that word is, but you know what I'm trying to say, right? Based on my gender, my age, whatever. Um, and so a lot of times that does show up in microaggressions and how people behave or what they say to you. And I know there's lots of information about microaggressions and what I call macroaggressions, just outright dirty language, <laughs> mistreatment, okay? Um, but I know there's a lot out there, so I'm not going to be teaching you about those. Go find another video. Um, but like I did have a situation where I didn't even really notice like there was a supervisor that would come to me to ask me for stuff. I think our role, right? They would come to me and ask me for stuff, and they would like be thrown in a bon ebonics, like, "Yo, what's up, girl? Hey, how you doing? Yo, yo, yo." I don't talk like that. <laughs> um, and so that was one of those times where my colleague was like, "I just heard them like basically talk to you in ebonics that they don't do with anybody else." <laughs> and while that one one is like, you know, it's a little silly, but it is indicative of. Why do people treat us differently other than how we would like to be treated? And what does that look like? Um, and so the action that I would recommend in this situation and more serious situations where you are actively maybe being attacked or um, under undercut, whatever that may look like, is that you, you, that you want to actually wait in this situation to take action. And you have to ask yourself two questions. One is, is it safe? And two, what do I want? Those conversations, those questions have to be asked before you take action, right? Um, and what do I mean by is it safe? So I've had a lot of black women that I've talked to, coaches, mentees, that something has been done to them in the workplace. And some of them are as serious as, you know, somebody not giving them the appropriate accommodation accommodations for their disabilities. Some of them have been as serious as taking a pay cut. Right. And so there are these real implications of workplace culture and what that means for our pockets and our long term success, even our stability, our lifestyle, all those types of things. But the first thing is, are you in a safe environment to be able to have that conversation? Some people are. Some people are in a situation where people want to do better. They care about the employees. They care about what's going on, but they just didn't realize what they did or how they did it. And I would say that's well-intentioned, and it does happen to us as Black women all the time. 
but there are some organizations where you may go tell one person and that's just going to end up on you of maybe being political or being manipulative or being aggressive or whatever that is. And if you know that there will be no support for you, that you will be going up that hill, fighting that fight by yourself, you have to decide what you want. And I feel like too many black women are putting themselves in a situation where they are saying what they want is justice and saying what they want is, you know, revenge or to get to be heard. And ultimately, I don't think that puts us in a safe position for life, right? Because I said, when we get fired, when we get, you know, laid off, when we get X, Y, Z, we have so much more time that we have. We're unemployed for longer periods of time. We're underemployed for longer periods of time. And so the question is not, do I want to be respected in this situation? It's what do I want out of my career? What do I want for my family? What do I want for my financial situation? What do I want for my career projection? And in, honest, in all honesty, the best revenge that you can have on an organization who does not treat you well is to move on, is to be somewhere else, is to be independent, is to make more money, is to be promoted elsewhere. Okay, I've gone on too long. <laughs> Okay, so if you consider both all of those things, you can make the decision that you want. But if you do make a decision to stand up and make the change, whether it's big or small, no matter what those repercussions are, then you want to go at this from a boundaries basis. So if somebody has said something to you that you don't like, has done something to you that you don't like, you need to set a boundary. Um, and so boundaries are not you controlling what other people do, it's controlling your actions, but you can communicate what your boundaries are, right? So if somebody's consistently cutting you off, you can make a statement and say, hey, I noticed in meetings you've really been cutting me off. I really appreciate it if you'd allow me to, um, yeah, make sure that I can complete my sentences or really get across the idea that I'm trying to get across before you cut me off. Now you cannot control what that person does, but you get to control what you do after that, right? So that could be, you know, I do feel like I've been disrespected in this conversation. I haven't been heard. I think I'm going to need to exit this project. I think I'm going to need to exit this conversation. You know, please let me know if, you know, you'd like me to be heard, right? You have those boundaries and you can say what you're going to do as a result. And your boundaries might be to leave the organization. <laughs> so, my advice here is you cannot fix a disrespectful um, culture. You can't fix a culture that's not willing to see the impacts that is, that's being made upon you based on their decisions, what they're doing, the culture. Um, so if that's where you are, then you may need to exit love and do not, do not blame yourself for these things, okay? Okay, number three, the next one is promotions and compensation. Do we need to reference the pay gap for black women? No, we do not. <laughs> I mean, we know it's here, right? But but we know, right? We know. We're not having this conversation with other people. We're having this conversation with us. <laughs> so my story for this one is I was in a position where I was really leading to a lot of comp yeah, a lot of revenue coming in for the organization, a lot of cost savings and optimizing a lot of HR processes. And so when I tell you that I was more than earning my paycheck, <laughs> okay, I'm more than earning my paycheck. <laughs> I was doing two, three, few, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people's jobs. <laughs> I know because they had to hire a lot of people to replace me, okay? That being said, um, in that role, I was severely underpaid, right? I. Um, I don't want to put any details. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so I was severely underpaid. There were many reasons why. Um, and I did stay at that organization for longer than I felt like I really should. In hindsight, right? I wasn't thinking about this at the time. Um, and so once I realized that I was really significantly underpaid, I made a case. I made a case. I said, here's my duties when I started. Here's my duties now. Here's the difference. And here's what I should be paid based on my credentials, right? Um, and so after I submitted that case, it was quote unquote denied, like nobody told me it was denied, but I, what I asked for, I did not receive. 
Um, and this is guidance for all black women. Like when you're going into a situation like that, you need to be firm on your boundaries, right? You need to be firm on what you want. Because if you go into that situation and you are making a case or you're making a request and ask of whatever it is, be that more flexible time, be that more pay, be that a title change, if you don't get it, you need to be prepared to either get, make sure that you have a plan to continue to advocate for yourself for a finite period of time or you need to exit. Because if you ask and they don't give it to you, they know they never have to give you anything again. They know. So be mindful of that. So in my case, it was denied. I went back and I said, you know, I'm very disappointed. I, I put a lot of time into this case. I did my research and I presented that and I didn't even get, you know, any response. Um, the reason that I even knew it was declined is because I saw my paycheck when I expected this to have been reviewed, right? And so at that point, the request, the case that I submitted was approved. The changes that I requested were approved, but I was already pissed off. And so I was prepared to leave, right? Because I'm not, I'm not going to continue to tell you about how much value I provide to you when I already provided that in the case. And I didn't even have, you didn't have the decency to like come talk to me about it, right? Um, and so it's, so really to talk about that story and unpack it, right? There were a couple of things that I took action on, right? I understood what the expectations are, right? So I, and it's different, right? Because I was in human resources. But if there's a promotion or compensation change, what is the expected route to submit that case? Um, what does that look like process-wise, right? So for me, I knew that there was a certain period of time when there were promotions, performance reviews, evaluations, those types of things. But I also knew what they were looking for from me, right? I knew what my goals were. I knew how I was providing value. I knew what my tangible objectives were and the value that I was providing. So I knew the expectations start to finish on everything related to my case and my work, right? And then I continued to do my research after that, right? So I knew what my 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 duties were. I knew what how they had changed, what the compensation differences were. Um, and really what, um, yeah, the value that I was providing, right? I did my research in many different ways to ensure that I was building a case that was fair, right? Um, if you need help with the compensation, um, I will link to pay scale below. Um, that's who I recommend you pull your salary reports from, okay? Um, also plug... If you need help building a case around any of your promotions or whatever, compensation adjustments, like you can schedule a call. Um, that's a service that I provide for career coaching. Anyway, <laughs> so I did my research and then three, I built the case. So in that case, you can do a presentation, you can do a Word document, do not do a case <laughs> verbally, okay? Do it in writing. And you need to say, what is it that you're asking for? Why is it justified and the value that the case provides? So if it is a promotion, you're going to say, here is the value that is provided for me coming into this job. Like, here are my new duties. Here are the other things. In my case, my salary is severely lagging. And so I was sharing, a, uh, I was indicating how that value had already been provided. Um, or if it's compensation, you're just going to make a case around your misalignment for compensation, right? Um, based on what's in the market. So those are the actions. Um, my advice here is very well connected to my story, um, which is when someone tells you who they are, believe them. Thank you, Miss Maya Angelou, for your words of wisdom and sage advice. If an organization much like the one that I worked for showed me who they really were, that they were not willing to compensate, and they did not recognize the value that I was providing, that's not an organization that I wanted to be with any longer. I will tell you from there till now in my career, I have never had to advocate to be at the top of my pay band ever again.
I'm not saying that I fought for those things. I'm not saying that I even had to work for them. I'm saying they've just been given to me, right? Because you have to be in an organization that is willing to value you for your, for who you are and what you can do, right? Okay, number four. Number four is performance. This one is probably the most insidious out of them all um, because often it is used to control black women and to convince them to stay in organizations that do not have their well-being in mind, do not care about them, okay? Um, and I don't care whether or not you think organizations should care about you, they should. So, so in my story, right, I was working for quite some time, had, had received promotions, had, perceived, had received pay bumps, um, but I've never felt recognized for the work that I did. It kind of felt thankless in many ways. And I think it's just really like I I felt like I wasn't really celebrated in my role. I felt like I was sometimes, but not all the time. And so it was one of those things where I felt like I was doing my best work. I was really dedicated, but I wasn't being trusted with the work. Um, everything was kind of not right. Didn't matter which way, how I did it. And those types of things really do impact you over time they impact your self-worth they impact really how you see yourself employability wise right because then you start to think like oh, I guess I'm not really that great I'm not really all that in a bag of chips um and so while it never showed up like on a performance review for me like oh you're messing up it was a clear um dissatisfaction with my performance right um, sometimes it does look more formal. Maybe it's a performance improvement plan. Um, more, maybe it is something where, you know, you just don't really get, you know, publicly praised or privately placed praise for that matter. You know, you just can't do anything right. And there will always be organizations that are like that or managers that are like that. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with you. At the end of the day, here's the action that you want to take, Right. You want to seek clarity first. So if something has gone wrong with performance, it is not enough for your supervisor or for your organization just to say, We're, you're not performing as expected. You need to ask what good, what excellence, what meets expectations looks like in writing. Like I want it written down. I want it in my job description. I want it on my performance review. I want it written on our check-ins, what you are looking for from me, especially if they're saying I'm not meeting them, right? Um, and some of the times these, you know, especially when it feels like a moving target, it's intentional love. Like they are trying to get you out of the organization and they're going to pad whatever, um, or they just don't like you. And that ain't got nothing to do with you. Something Sometimes you did nothing wrong. Sometimes you're working at your best. And it's not good enough for them because they don't want to see you thrive, okay? Um, and I've seen so many of that, especially with high-performing black women, that others are threatened by in the workplace. So after you seek clarity, you are going to make sure that everyone is held accountable to those standards. So for instance, if they said, this is the report, this is how the report should be done, this is when it's due, blah, blah, blah. If they haven't told you that level of detail, you cannot hold anybody accountable to how your performance, for your performance, right? Um, and I know that's weird. You're like, I'm holding somebody else accountable. You're holding them accountable for the expectations that they set for you, right? Um, because you can't, you can't meet expectations that are changing. You can't meet expectations that are constantly rising because they want you to do something different here and there, there's no way for you to succeed in that scenario. And so you need to make sure you get that in writing and you need to make sure that if somebody's calling you out for a performance issue or something that's amiss, you need to go back to them and say, this is what we decided, this is what we talked about. You know, I'm fine if we need to, you know, readjust this or change things, but this is what we agreed to. So I'm not sure that this, the communication that you're making is helpful. Um, in the particular situation that I had, um, I did start to document every request, every change, everything we discussed. Um, and that was really comforting to me to make sure like, you know, I'm not going to this next meeting and being gaslit. Like I know what happened and what we disagreed upon. Okay. So if that's something that you need, like you may need it and it's okay. <laughs> I started to talk about that in the beginning of this, of 
these things can really start to wear you down, especially if it's gaslighting, if it's toxic, if it's, you know, undervaluing you, um, you know, tanking your self-esteem. These things are going to add up. They are going to impact your personal life. They are going to make you feel like shit. <laughs> okay. So if you have any performance, I'm going to say this, any performance issue that's more than a, just like a coaching moment, we all, we're not perfect, right? But anything that's really like, oh, they are saying my performance is below expectations, like you need to go ahead and leave. Whether, or don't look at your pride, you're like, oh man, I got it right. You don't want to get it right to the expense of potentially losing your paycheck or potentially not being able to advance or get into another organization because of that okay go ahead and prepare your resume and get out of there do not stay and it is not your fault <sighs> all right <clears throat> i need some water we're getting into bonus stuff of like what to do okay <laughs> but i talked a lot um so before we get into bonus stuff i want to share like I told you a little bit earlier, right, that I do help with coaching and cases and things like that when black women are facing these issues, but I also wanted to provide a, a service that is really affordable, that could be ongoing, that can really help black women, especially when they're facing certain things like this. You know, they're not getting the promotions, they're not getting the compensation, but they do need help and support with growing. I created a mentoring service for that need. And I was actually having black women saying, like, I need mentoring in my community. I'm not sure if I need career coaching right now, but I need mentoring because I need to get to the stage. And I need an expert in human resources and recruitment um, and who is also advancing their career as a black woman. Um, I need that guidance. So if any of this has resonated with you and you have not felt that you are aware of how to navigate some of these things, I think that career mentoring with me would be really helpful for you. Um, career mentoring is, again, this informal yet helpful way for you to get that ongoing guidance. So depending on which option you choose, if you should choose, um, we either meet once a month or twice a month for 30 minutes or 60 minutes. So you just let me know really what you're looking for, the level of support, and I'll provide the right mentoring package for you. Um, I did say it was important for me to make sure that this was an affordable thing. So my mentoring is literally starting at $47 a month, right? Um, at the time of this video, right? I don't know if today's price will be tomorrow's price, but you're locked in for mentoring at the point in which you yeah, become my mentee. And it's not just those ongoing classes. You also get access to the Career Love Community, which is a community for ambitious, passion-driven Black women. Um, and so you get trainings, you get ongoing events, uh, community in that. We had a group chat, okay? And the ladies are really lovely. So they're either in the community, a coaching client, or a mentee. Um, and so it's really fabulous. So if you want to learn more, um, you can definitely send me a message, schedule a call, um, but I'll also make sure to put a link to become a mentee um, below so that you can deal with all the BS and I can help you with it. <laughs> okay, so I said that I was going to give you some advice at the end about, you know, well, I was going to, of course, share one of my favorite stories and then I was going to give you some advice um, about action. So I think the most important thing here is that you have to always take know and observe. I shared in one of my stories that, um, you know, I didn't always know when something was ageist, sexist, discriminatory, whatever we want to call it, <laughs> um, unpleasant, right? I didn't always notice when whether that was charged based on my identity as a woman, as a black woman, as a young black woman. Um, and so it took me time to really start to observe things and be um, coherent and understand that it wasn't just people being people. I mean, it is people being people, but it's more insidious than that. And it's more of a way to tank you in your career. Um, and so I had to start observing and taking note. Um, and then once I was observing and taking notes, and I did perceive that there may or may not be a threat, I started to document things. Um, and so what did that look like? Um, it meant, you know, keeping the emails 
uh, based on people's responses to me. It meant including other colleagues in meetings. Um, it meant I was HR, so there was nobody else to go to but me. <laughs> um, you know, it was making sure that I brought in other people who were allies in that organization with me. And I never like playing the political game, but sometimes you need to be sad, political, politically savvy in order to move correctly in an organization, right? Um, we have to start thinking about these things. So observe, take notes, and then document. And when you're documenting them, do not save them on your company computer, right? Because should something happen, you have no access to that, right? Should it become a court case, it's that bad, it's really discriminatory. Like I said, I've had clients that have been discriminated against based on their gender, uh, based on their disabilities and things like that. And I do not talk, I am not providing legal advice, nor do I provide legal advice to my mentees, but I'm going to tell you to document everything. <laughs> that is one thing I will tell you, okay? Write everything down, store it somewhere safe, and make sure that you're taking notes of when these things happen, specifically what was said and how it adversely impacted you in that moment, okay? Because those are the things that you need later. Number three, don't be a martyr. <laughs> When I said earlier, ask what you want. I'm really encouraging your, your want to not be to be a martyr, right? Don't do things out of pride. Don't do things out of revenge. Don't do things out of spite. It may feel better in the moment, okay? But it is not going to get you to where you want to be. If your desire is to have a fulfilling job, to be respected at work, to be fairly compensated, to advance your career, it's very unlikely that getting revenge or getting even justice, even if it's not from a place of, you know, oh, I just gotta get him back. Even if it's not that, if even if it comes from a good place, if I want the world to be a better place for black women, go make that a better place in organizations that at a bare minimum respect black women because that's probably, if you're, if you're still here, <laughs> that's probably not the organization that you're in, right? Um, and so you have to think about what is it that I really want and what do I need to do to get what I really want? If what I want is to leave and get a position that is more aligned with how I want to feel at work and how I want to be treated, then your goal is to make sure that you are able to stay as safe as you can, as you can in that organization and then exit, right? You can say everything and anything you want to as you leave, right? But not while you're there. Now, I mean, you can, but I, my goal is for you to be safe, okay, and have a good life and be compensated and have the career that you want, okay? That's um, it. So the last thing is, it, it is related to what I just said. Make the move that is safest for you. Make sure that whatever you do, um, you ensure that no matter the potential blowout, um, of that situation, you know, that you're going to land on your feet and be in an okay place. If you're like, you know what, I'm good. I got some financial cushion. I'm fighting this fight because it's it's based on my values. It's what I want to do. That's okay, okay? I'm not saying that you can't stand up for what's right. Like, I, of course, do that all the time. And it's my job to do that <laughs> as a diversity manager. But my thing is, is like when you're in an organization that has no capacity to change, no capacity to see anything different, when you're fighting a good fight for nothing, um, I don't think that's even a good fight, right? <laughs> is it a good fight? So what I'm saying here is pick your battles, make sure that the work that you do, the effort that you take is for people and organizations that are worth it. I personally feel that for the stands that I've take, took, taken, took in, did. Anyway, for the stands that I have made, it has been all worth it. Um, and I wouldn't change anything. I might not have stayed as long, but I wouldn't change anything about my career. I think it learned, it helped me learn, it helped me grow, and it helped me make, you know, content like this that can help other black women. So um, what I want to know from you as we start to wrap up the video is have you dealt with any of this discrimination in your career? I'm sure you have. Um, but what other advice might you offer to black women in similar situations? I definitely want to hear from you all. And of course, this community is a great place to start to do those things. My last story is a short story. I've told lots and lots of stories. Um, but one of the ones that really hit me is that I was in an interview. I was in one of the final rounds 
um, of the interview process. And I had made it a practice to ask questions about the organization's DEI initiatives. What are you doing to foster a, um, you know, a safe, productive, inclusive, a diverse workplace um, and I would ask specifically what have they done I don't want to hear about what the organization is doing especially from leaders I want to hear about what they're doing specifically intentionally on their own um, and I would get a variety of answers but one of the ones that really hit me was basically the CEO of the organization that I was interviewing for and they were like well I would want to and yeah so I think I said something about um, hiring a question about that about hiring because it was a talent acquisition position and they said to me well I would want to hire qualified talent first and it was one of those <laughs> what moments because not this man saying I don't think diverse talent is qualified <laughs> in an interview with a black woman that you're interviewing for for talent acquisition a talent acquisition position um, and so I take that story with me everywhere to say, you know, do not take for granted um, that organizations will do right by you. Make sure you're screening them and also do your due diligence because not asking these types of questions can really get you into a place where you, you are in a toxic workplace. And what we value most is our mental, emotional, financial well-being, okay, and our families. Um, so one of the things that I did to tackle things like this, a lot of the times we really focus on the negative, like, oh, here are the companies that I would never work for. But I wanted black women to have a place where we can go and we can access, you know, organizations that other black women have vouched for. So that's what I created. It's called the Black Woman Approved Workplaces Database. And I have a list of employers that other black women have vouched for that said they provided a safe um, inclusive workplace for them to work in. Um, so if you want access to that database, you can find it below. Um, and you can even add to that database. So if you know any employers that you've worked for currently or before, uh, or, or yeah, currently or before, <laughs> if you know any employers that should be added that, to that list, please comment them below. I do add them periodically to that database so that that can really be circulated. Also, please share this video with other black women as well as that database who really need that. Okay, well this video, as always, was way longer than I thought it would be, but I just, I'm so passionate about this, right? I think as black women, we just, it's so hard. We have to be so intentional about how we hold ourselves, how we're perceived, and making sure that we're not in safe places in our career. So um, it's something that, you know, sorry, I think I'm at 40 minutes now, but I just really wanted you all to know and get that context and know how to move and what's going to really ultimately get you into the place that you want to be. Um, so if you're watching, you're still here. Thank you. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe. If you know another black woman who needs this kind of love um, and information, then share that with her. And if you want to become my mentee or get access to the database, all that information will be listed below. So yeah, see y'all later. <laughs> Bye. I'm sure there's another video around here. Um, we're good stuff to watch. So, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. <laughs>